I'm Doug Sillers. Um, a little bit about me. I am currently traveling with my family, as Matteo said, um, doing freelance developer relations, uh, doing performance audits, web, native apps, and I lead workshops on performance, images, and video. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, you can obviously reach out to me. And the great thing with having a unique name is I'm on Twitter, I'm Doug Sillers. My email is Doug Sillers, my website, Doug Sillers. And I'll be posting the slides from tonight on my SlideShare, which is SlideShare slash Doug Sillers. All right. Um, so before we get started with web performance and image performance, how many of you th get sort of a pit in your stomach when you think about walking across this platform in the Alps that's like nailed to the side of a mountain with a hundreds of foot drop below you, right? It's, it's kind of like one of those terrifying things. Lots of people have a fear of heights. We did this with my family. My then six-year-old thought it'd be fun to jump the whole way, so it rattled through the whole walk as we walked across. Um, but everybody did it, and it was awesome. So in relation to that, Ericsson did a study about web performance and mobile app performance, and they put sensors on people's brains to measure how people reacted to different stressful things. And they found that queuing up in line is raises your stress level because you have to wait in line. They found that standing on the edge of a cliff raises your stress level. But interestingly, they found that having a slow mobile experience is actually more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. So that feeling you just felt is what your customers feel when your website is slow. Or they actually feel it worse than that feeling you get from the edge of a cliff. So you want to avoid that feeling. And there are a lot of stats. People have done a lot of research on what makes um, applications slow. Google found, I've got a laser, which is fun. Uh, with a three second delay on a web page, 53% of people abandon the website. Uh, over here, 500 millisecond delay, people get frustrated and less engaged. You know, one of the classic studies from you know, a long time ago on the desktop, Walmart and Amazon found that people spend less money which obviously is a bad thing. But probably most importantly is 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phones when there's a slow mobile experience. And you know, there's, there's, I actually have a reference for that. That's not made up. Uh, <laughs> so like, what can we do to prevent these things from happening? People hate slow experiences. Well, if we look at the HTTP archive, and the HTTP archive is a study of the top as up until June, it was the top half million websites on mobile and desktop. They're upping it now to 1.5 million sites, and they study it every two weeks. And so on July 1st, desktop was 1.5 million sites. It didn't work for mobile. It's still only half a million sites. Um, but soon, we're going to have more and more sites. But what they found is that the average website is 50% images. And so if your website is 50% images, that's a one huge place for potential optimizations to speed up your website or your native app. Um, we can talk about that later too. So what am I using for my image performance analysis? Matteo mentioned web page test a little bit earlier. Web page test is a great tool to run synthetic tests of your, of your web page. You can test on, on uh, native devices. Um, and they're actual real devices. They're in um, the guy who runs web page tests. His name is Pat Meenan and he has hundreds of devices in the basement next to the Christmas decorations. And you can read the blog post where he shows a picture of it right next to the Christmas decorations in his basement. Um, you can test on real devices. They're all around the world, so you can test how your web page behaves all around the world. And one of the great things is web page test uses Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is in your Chrome Dev Tools, <coughs> which is a great, and it's a great performance tool, but it's also in integrated into web page tests. So when you run those tests, uh, you can actually get the Lighthouse results as well. And both of them show up in the HTTP archive. So the HTTP, HTTP archive every two weeks is doing a half million or now 1.5 million websites with web page test and Lighthouse. So we can look at the optimizations that these two tools give you across a half million websites to see where, where we stand and what can be improved. And so Lighthouse, and this is not the most recent, the most recent version 3.0 has a few more, but this was, you know, uh, 2.8 or something. 
they have four image optimizations, and those are image quality, image format, sizing, and lazy loading. And the Lighthouse scores are on a sliding scale where zero, which is blue, is bad, and green at 100 is really, really good. And so we're going to look to see where these scores show for a half million websites. And the first one we're going to look at is quality. And so what image quality is, is as you all may know, this is preview on, on, a, on, my, uh, on my Mac. And you can see as I lower the quality, the image size gets smaller. Right? As I lower the quality, it's, the image size is getting smaller. So smaller sizes images is great. The problem is, of course, we're lowering the quality. And if you lower it too much, people will see the difference in quality because we're actually removing pixel information when we do that. Um, Lighthouse and Google recommends that 85% quality on all images. What is 85% quality and what does that mean? It depends what tool you're using. All the tools use different percentages for what quality is, but in general, 85% is good enough. And so if you use something like Image Magic, you can just set quality 85 and it saves you a new image. A tool like Cloudinary, which is a cloud-based, you upload the full-size image, and then in the URL, you can just put Q85 in the image and it generates on the fly a quality 85 image for you. So it's gonna be a smaller image. So what do we see when we look at a half million websites with the HTTP archive? Well, what we see is that a full third of the internet is doing no optimization for uh, image quality to 85. We see that 43% are, are completely passing. So that's good, right? Almost half the internet's doing the right thing, but a full third is doing the wrong thing. They're not doing any optimization. If we look at those sites that got a zero, um, the median, so the 50th percentile on a 3G network would be 2.8 seconds faster load time and save 419 kilobytes of data. So this is a pretty significant savings. On a slower network connection, the percent saving, the percent speed up will be even more. So if you're on a slower connection, um, it may, it'll be even more seconds of speed up for the load time if you make these images smaller. Um, I just spent... Uh, a month in West Cork, which is Ireland, which is a very rural area of Ireland. And my Airbnb promised that it had Wi-Fi, and it did, but they didn't tell me that it was connected to a 3G router that was often only on edge. And so my kids were like, Dad, we have Wi-Fi. Why is it so slow? And they didn't understand that the connection from the router to the internet was the, was the broken link. But this is Mizzenhead Lighthouse out in Ireland. And the original image I took on my phone is 2.8 megabytes at 100%. If I save it at quality 85, I more than half the size, right? It's now 1.3 megabytes. Huge improvement. It's still a really, really big image. Um, so Google recommends 85% as a good, like it works pretty much for everybody, but could we go lower? What about 50%? And we're down, you know, we've halved it yet again, more than halved it yet again. Um, and the image, if you start looking in the clouds, you start seeing there's some pixelization up in the clouds up over in here. Um, if you go to 20%, you can really see it. It looks horrible. So we don't want to go to 20%. That's too low. But if we look, um, you know, 85%, we've already saved more than half of the kilobytes right, from 2.8 to 1.3. We know that one looks bad, but where's the sweet spot in the middle? Can we find a sweet spot in the middle of image quality? And luckily we can. Google has a tool called Booter Augli. Um, I think all the Google compression folks are in Switzerland and they name everything after pastries. Broadly, you know, Booter Augli, Zopfli, they're all pastries, which is fun. There's also structural similarity, which is a similar algorithm and what it does is it finds the difference where the human eye you lower the quality to where the human eye can't tell a difference and so you know you, there's this is a tool that Tobias Baldoff has built that does that you just give this image and it gives you the optimized image Cloudinary will do that you just set Q auto and on the fly on, on the, in the cloud it will generate the optimized image for you and when I do that with those two tools I'm down to Six, between 600 and 900 kilobytes, depending on which tool I do. And if you look, that's another huge savings. Like we've, we're down at like, you know, 
I don't know, like one fifth the size of the original image just by finding that optimal quality size. So I can build a web page of all of these different websites with, his, with these images and look at the load time. And what we see is, of course, it goes from 17 seconds. This is on a web page test, uh, Moto G4. So I'm testing on a mobile device. It goes from 17 seconds to 6.7 seconds load time. So we've, you know, it's three times faster load time. You know, the, the number of kilobytes have dropped by a, a whole lot. So this is a great way to optimize your images. Um, and we can apply other optimizations on top of that. The next one that I'm going to talk about is image format. So if we look in the HTTP archive, the average image sizes, like JPEGs are the biggest, you know, 48. The average JPEG is about 48 kilobytes. You know, we've got uh, PNGs and WebP and a bunch of others. Let's talk about SVGs really quick, vector graphics. Vector graphics are great for small, simple images like icons. Um, because the images are drawn as vectors, as shapes. They're infinitely scalable, and you can add them as X, they're XML, so you can add them in line to your HTML content, and they're infinitely scalable. That's the same Twitter icon. It looks jaggy here because PowerPoint doesn't let me put SVGs in my PowerPoint, so they're screenshots of an SVG. So trust me, it isn't jaggy when you actually do it the right way. But you can screw up SVGs, and I'm going to give you an example. You may recognize this logo, pretty popular website. This is a web page in Brazil that built the Facebook logo to put at the top of their page. And you can download the, the XML and open it in your favorite text editor. And what you can see is at the bottom, there's, I, I enlarged it so you can see it, but there's all this Adobe Illustrator stuff. They built it in Adobe Illustrator, and they saved it, and Adobe Illustrator added... Um, 1.3 megabytes of crap, right? So I went into the, into the editor, and, in my text editor, and I removed it, and it's 900 bytes, <laughs> right? That's 99.9 something percent savings, right? And then, of course, because it's XML, I can gzip it, or I can use Google's Broadly, uh, which is a, you know, it's, it's like gzip. It takes a little longer to compress, people uh, say, but it unzips the same speed, and I get it down to 440 bytes, so huge savings. This web page had five SVGs that they screwed up this way, so the whole web page was like nine megabytes, but five megabytes was just bad SVG files. Really slowed down the website, um, so be really careful. Like, if you do something like this, they were doing the right thing, but then they didn't, they just pushed it to production and didn't test it, so like test, that's always a good thing to do. Um, but I'd also like to talk about WebP images. And if you look here, you know, WebP images, WebP is a Google format. Um, it's newer than JPEG. JPEG is from the 90s, and WebP is about four or five years old. So it's got more compre newer compression algorithms. And you can see the average size is about half the size of JPEG, uh, according to uh, the HTTP archive. It's really easy to create WebP files. You can do it in ImageMagick. You can do it in Cloudinary just by saying format equals auto, and it will generate WebP. If you're on Chrome, it'll generate JPEG 2000 or PNG. It'll find the smallest file um, for whatever browser you're in and do it on the fly. So if I take that same image of rural Ireland and I do structural similarity, so I do Q auto, quality auto, and format auto. You can see it still says JPEG here, but it serves it actually as a WebP. And I'm down to 400 to 500 kilobytes, so that's a huge savings. And you can see I shave off from just changing it to WebP, I shave off another 600 milliseconds, so it's getting faster and faster. Now you might say, well, WebP, that's Google, right? And yes, that's true. It, it is only supported today in Chrome and Android, which, you know, that's a little bit limiting. But last month or about six weeks ago, the, the summary at the bottom, the notes, became a lot more interesting where Safari and Firefox are experimenting with WebP and it's in development for Edge. So, you know, for a while, everybody's been saying, well, use JPEG 2000 for the other browsers, use WebP for Google and then JPEG for everyone who doesn't support any of those things. But it looks like by the end of the year, modern browsers will all support WebP, or they may. And that is a huge improvement from, um, for a performance perspective, because we're going to get lots smaller images. If we look at the Lighthouse data, 
And Lighthouse is the, the HTTP archive always tests on Chrome and on mobile Chrome. And so it's looking at WebP images. And what we see is a full two thirds of the internet are not optimizing for image formats. They're getting a zero score. And what we also see is the median page, again, uh, that gets a zero score, it would be 4.1 seconds faster and save about 600 kilobytes of data just by switching the JPEGs and the PNGs to WebP. So that's a huge potential performance savings and it may be even better very, very soon when it's in more browsers. The last thing I'm gonna talk about for just one image at a time is image sizing. And so, again, I took this image with my smartphone, right? It's 3,000 by, it's 13 megapixels, right? 3,000 by 4,000 pixels. It was 1.6 megabytes. I do all the stuff I talked about earlier with structural similarity and WebP. I get it half the size to 804 kilobytes. So that's great. But the problem is these dimensions are still really huge. If I try to load it in my phone, and let's just say it ends up being 600 by 800, I end up throwing away 12.4 million pixels of data. So this is sort of like double taxation for mobile users. You download 800 kilobytes, and then you throw away 95% of the, the data that you just downloaded. On a lower powered phone, you have to power up the CPU to throw away 95% of it. The phone's gonna get hot. Um, there's just a recent, you know, um, Android Go is a new thing where it's a, uh, for low powered smartphones. And you might think, well, low powered smartphones, that's areas of the world that I don't care about. Well, the second largest market that they're thinking about for Android Go is the United States of America. And they're these really, really, really low powered phones that are really, really scary when you look at their specs. They are not the phones that we have in our pockets. They are not the phones that our kids have in their pockets. They are not the phones that, you know, they're like Android, the, the specs are like Android phones from like 2013, 2014. These are like really like ancient, really slow phones, but they're gonna be selling a lot of them in America. So you have to be really, you have to think about this. Like this, this is just too big of an image. And the only analogy I can think of is like when you buy something from Amazon, and they send you a giant box and you have to pull out like 15 yards, 15 meters of brown paper before you find like two pens in the bottom of the box. That's exactly what we're doing when we send these large images to mobile devices. But you know, this optimization isn't straightforward. These are the Android devices that hit Akamai in one day around Christmas time of last year. So the size of the box is how many of each device. These are all Samsung devices. So there are a lot of Samsung S7s and S8s. Green means that they're fast devices. Red means they're really slow devices. And so you can see there's lots of different screen sizes, lots of different devices. I think it was 6,600. And as you reach the event horizon down here in the corner, you can see that there's a lot of devices that are really, really slow that are gonna be really, it's gonna be a detrimental effect if you have those large images. So on the web, what we've done is we've done responsive images where you generate a different set of images, 25 kilobytes different in size. That's kind of the common sizing that people recommend. And so, you know, if I do that and I build a bunch of different sized images, I can find one that's, you know, 519,000 pixels. So I'm only wasting 100,000 pixels now. So that's a lot better than 12.4 million or whatever it was earlier. So the tool I used for that is a responsive breakpoint generator. So I said, generate a bunch of images between 200 and 1400 pixels, 25 kilobytes apart, maximum of 20 images, and it gives me a whole bunch of images. And then you can download them and put them on your website. Uh, this is also open source, so if you want to integrate it into your tooling, you can do that as well. Um, and what you end up is you end up with something like this. And so for every different size, I have a different image. But rather than look at code, it's always more fun to actually look at a live demo. So we're going to see if it comes back. And if it doesn't, I know I have to hit reset down here. And I hit reset. And it's, it did something here. If it doesn't do the live demo, I have a video too, but live demos are always cooler. All right, it's thinking. There we go, awesome. We, 
So let me go to the browser. All right, so I'm in full screen mode. Let's get out of full screen mode. This is the same website that I was just showing you the code for. And as I change the size of the screen, it's going to load a different image when they're 25 kilobytes apart. And so that you can see the difference, every other image is sepia. So it's going to go color to sepia to color to sepia when you see a new image load. So as I reduce the size, there are a lot of jumps between 1400, once it hits 1400 pixels, and I'm not sure, there we go. There are a lot of jumps here at the very beginning because shaving off pixels with really large images makes a lot of jumps, right? So they're going to have a lot of jumps right here. And what's great about this, as I get even smaller, is on your small smartphone, you get an image that is 28 kilobytes. And on a big screen like this, you get an image that is 200 kilobytes. So you get the perfect size image for the, the, right dev for the device that needs it. Um, so that's a great way. Uh, responsive images is a great way to make sure that that happens. And so this is the code. We'll go to full size and fingers crossed. We'll just let it sit here for a second. And if not, I know what button to press. Maybe I'll just hit it. It's thinking. Okay, my, my screen flashed here, so that's a good sign. Then this one will flash, and then yeah, we're figuring it out. And we'll get rid of the. All right. And so, what you can actually see here is you know, I'm using Cloudinary again, so I set the width in the URL. And so you can set the width in the URL, and it generates that image on the fly. And then you can see every other one has the sepia parameter. So I'm just doing that on the fly, too. It's generating sepia on the fly. So that's kind of cool. And that's the video in case it didn't work. All right, so now what we can see is when we go responsive on a mobile device, it's now serving the right sized image. So we go down from like this one megabyte image down to an image that's 120 kilobytes. We go from seven seconds load time to two seconds load time. Huge performance and speed improvement. So, you know, I sort of mentioned this earlier. You can go responsive images and image format. So here are all the WebPs. Here are all the JPEGs. The browser, if it can do WebP, will pick one of those. If it can't, it'll do JPEGs. Um, we're hoping that we can get away with just two. Some people have three or four of these for different um, for all the different browsers. Uh, in Chrome, there's a great thing, client hints. And so it'll actually send the width up to the server. It'll send the width of the viewport up to the server. And so then you can just set the width. The brow your server can set the width. And in this case with Cloudinary, I can set the width to auto. And it sends down the right width image automatically. So what's great about that is your code for each image goes from this to one line, which is obviously a lot more readable and easy to look at. Unfortunately, client hints right now is again just Google. It's just Chrome and just Android. But we're hoping that that is going to grow. It's, it's a spec in the W3C. Responsive images is the most used of these three in the wild. You can see 57% are scoring 100%. This is sort of everyone went mobile first. And so everybody did responsive images. Well, everybody but this fifth of the internet did responsive images. And this fifth of the internet is not doing any of that. And those people who are not doing it could save 400 kilobytes and 2.7 seconds load time on a 3G connection. That's the median. So 50% are going to be slower, 50% be faster. And so those are all great. These are all individual image uh, improvements. And that's great if you have a web page with one image on it. But you know, most web pages don't have one image. They have two or maybe three. And so what you can do to improve that, the load of that, is you can do lazy loading. And so that's the last performance thing that's listed in, in Lighthouse. And there's this interesting study that came out earlier this year. And they were looking at how people track on desktop websites. And they found that 57% of people don't actually scroll on the web page, they just look at the above the fold content and don't scroll to the viewports below. 
17% hit the second screen. But once you get to third, fourth, fifth, most people aren't scrolling to see that content. They're just looking at what's at the top of the screen. So that's important. What are you putting at the top of your page, right? But it's also important if you've got a web page that looks like this one where I've got two images above the fold and I've got four images below the fold. What if I don't load those four images? That's going to make my web page load a lot faster. And that's what lazy loading is. Lazy loading is load those up later when, when, the, when the user scrolls down, if they scroll down. Um, and we know from this data that a full 40% may not actually scroll. All right. So what we see is 60% um, of the internet are not doing anything with lazy loading, 22% are passing, and those may actually just be single page websites, right? Because there's nothing below the fold, so there's no images, that may be why they're passing. Or low image websites. Those sites that are failing at this could save 500 kilobytes, 3.5 seconds load time. I mean, again, significant savings in the load time. Um, so what do we put in place? You can see here I put green, you know, placeholder images. And preview images are a huge thing these days. You've seen it in media and Pinterest does it. Um, this is Google image search on my phone. So when I search for cats in costume, you can see like there's this green one for the alligator cat, pink for the bunny cat. I don't know what kind of cat that is, orange. But, you know, what happens is as I'm loading the page, you get you know that these images are coming, you kind of have an idea what's going to be there based on the color, and then they pop into place. And this is great for like when you're reading a really long article, because sometimes on your phone, like the new image pops in and you lose your place while you're reading on the page, and I find that really annoying. But if these images pop into place immediately at load time, because maybe they're SVGs of just one color, they're just going to be a couple, couple bytes, um, that's a great way to um, speed that up. Um, there's a great open source tool called Squib that actually creates an SVG of your image. So you can see this image of waterfalls. There's sort of like inklings of it in the vector graphic. And so this is like a 900 byte image. I can load it inline. It shows up right away. And then when this 150, 190 kilobyte image of the waterfalls arrives, it just replaces it. So the user knows that it's coming. It pops into place when it arrives. If I take a web page with a bunch of images, I had it loading in four seconds, 200 kilobytes. I lazy load to get rid of those, those images below the fold, and I double the load, or I have the load time to two seconds. When I do the preview images, it gets a little bit bigger because I have all this, um, the SVG as, as text, so I, I gain two kilobytes, but actually, you know, it's still about two seconds to load. And so, I've talked a little bit about these four optimizations. We can actually look to see what's out there on the web, right? This is all from the HTTP archive. And what we can see is these are the 100 score. These are the sites that pass. And a full 30% of the internet does not pass all four of these tests, right? So there's a full 30% of the internet who could really improve with these performance, uh, with these performance uh, image performance uh, metrics. We can look right here, we can see that, you know, another 30% have just one optimization. 11% uh, kind of do those first two, optimizing images and responsive images. And, you know, there's about, I don't know what that is, 30% that are right in that sweet spot of two or three optimizations. Um, I mostly put this in here is because I always wanted to have a 4D Venn diagram in a presentation. Um, but what we can see here is 8% of the internet are doing all four of these optimizations. You know, another 8% are doing three. And so, you know, th what we want to do is we want to funnel everybody down into sort of this sweet spot in the middle where people are doing these optimizations to make their web pages faster. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about really briefly before I stop is animated GIFs because that's another huge part of the internet. Um, everybody loves a good GIF. Um, this is a video I took of my goat. This is Nora the goat, and here she is eating a, a cedar leaf. And I took this with my phone. It's 1.4 megabytes, and I want to gift this because we need more goats on the internet. And there it is, right? It's 256 colors because that's what gifts gifts were invented in the 1980s, and they were, we only had 256 colors in the 1980s. Remember? Yeah, it was only 200. That's why I tell my kids. 
right? That's what we're supposed to do as parents. Um, no, they don't believe me. Um, but if you actually read the spec for GIF, they say, we have an animated format. We don't recommend that anybody uses it. It's in the spec. Um, but that ship is sort of sailed, right? Everybody's using animated GIFs. And this animated GIF has a problem because it's actually 270% larger than the movie that I took on my phone. And the reason for that is animated GIFs is actually like a flip book of individual images. So if you have 15 frames per second in your GIF, you actually have 15 pictures of the goat that it's flipping through for every second. Um, so how can we make this smaller? Well, what if I make it a movie that's 256 colors? I just made it 93% smaller than, than the animated GIF, and that's pretty huge. And so we could load it as in a video on our web page. And so you can see on my, I've got loop, autoplay, and muted. And all videos that autoplay on mobile Safari and mobile Chrome have to be muted. And that's for when you're in a meeting and you're browsing on the internet, you don't want the videos to be loud because then people will know that you're browsing the internet and not paying attention in the meeting, right? Um, this is, so, or, or you're sitting in class, right? You don't want the video to play loud. So all videos have to be muted. Plays in line is for Safari. So this will loop um, that goat uh, video. The problem is video isn't preloaded. Browsers know that video files are really, really big, so it's always the last thing that browsers download. So if you need that GIF to show up quickly, this may not be the way to do it. It'll be the last thing loaded. Um, however, image tags are really, really fast. And today in Safari, you can actually put a video tag into the picture tag and it'll load and it'll loop. And it works on mobile Safari and it works on desktop Safari. It doesn't work in any other browser. But what, I, what you can do here is you can see I have the MP4. That will play in Safari. I have an animated WebP, which will play in Chrome. And then for everybody else, I've got the animated GIF here at the bottom. And if we look at the load times, you know, it goes from 3.8 megabytes for the animated GIF to three megabytes for the WebP to 250K for the, for the video. And so folks on Safari are going to have a much better, faster experience uh, with, with that looping video of the goat. So that's another thing that you can do to improve um, your web pages. And so in conclusion, I talked about a bunch of tools, web page test, HTTP archive, here are a bunch of the tools I use to optimize my images. I talked about Cloudinary, which is the cloud-based tool that lets you just modify it in the URL and, and generate these images on the fly. So in conclusion, images can be fast and they can be beautiful at the same time. And that's really, really important. And when I was talking to Cloudinary, I built a web page that's really, really slow. And you can see it. It's at uh, dougsillers.github.io. It takes 19.7 seconds to load on desktop. Don't try it on mobile. It's ugly. Um, but it's, it's 11 megabytes. And they're going to offer a 100 euro gift card if you can go to this GitHub site, optimize it, and then submit your entry to that, that thing, to that URL right there. And the fastest website gets. Um, 100 euro Amazon gift card. So that's pretty cool. So I'm pretty excited. I got the page down from 19 seconds to 0.2 seconds with the optimizations I talked about today. So if you're interested, check it out. I'll tweet the link later when I get back uh, after, the, after the meetup. And I'll post the slides too so you can see all this and get all the URLs as well. And so with that, I, I thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. And it looks like there might actually be pizza. So that's a good thing. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.